Welcome to the lecture for chapter 34. Here we're going to talk about nuclear fission and fusion, either the breaking apart of, an, of the nucleus of an atom or the fusing together of the nucleus of an atom. Okay? So in the last lecture, we talked about transmutation. And transmutation was primarily because of alpha particle and beta particle decay, which is to say we had, um, we had two hydrogen and two, and two neutrons, or we had one electron leaving the atomic nucleus, thus changing the element. We also talked about stimulated transmutation, like through neutron bombardment. But here in this chapter, we're going to talk about the most dramatic type of transmutation there is. That's where you take two nuclei and put them together, or you split one apart into two big chunks. Okay? So that's going to be fission and fusion. Okay? We'll talk a bit about their applications in terms of their, in terms of their reactors. We'll talk about getting power from fission. We'll talk about the mass energy equivalents and how it relates to fusion, as well as the idea of which elements are good for fission and which elements are good for fusion. Okay? So, the German sci scientist Otto, Hans, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann in 1938 accidentally discovered nuclear fission. They realized that they could split apart the, um, the nucleus of an atom by deforming it, by having it reach a critical deformation where the greater force, which was the electrostatic repulsive force between the protons, was so strong and at such a range that it overcame the strong nuclear force, which otherwise was dominant when the nucleus was not so critically deformed. Lise Meitner and Otto Fritsch explained the process and gave it the name of fission, the splitting apart of the nucleus of the atom. So, so uranium is well known for its fission capabilities, and it's a natural choice to think of a breaking apart a uranium atom, or at least its nucleus, because it has one of the largest naturally occurring nucleuses. It has the greatest number of nucleons, protons and neutrons. Okay? So here we're talking about uranium-235. That means it has 235 nucleons, 92 of which are protons. Okay? So we see you have 92 protons, and the remaining nucleons must all be neutrons, and there's 143 of those. And that just comes from 235 minus 92 equals 143. If you bombard it, this is kind of like the stimulated tra um, transmutation you talk about. If you bombard it with something like a neutron, that's going to cause that shape, which is the critical deformation, which allows for the electrostatic force to act and tear the nucleus apart. It also releases some other stray neutrons in the process, and it gives a significant amount of kin kinetic energy to both the daughter nuclei. That's the term often given to the product of the fission. Okay? And a significant amount of energy. Now, the energy mostly is in the form of the kinetic energy, although there, there are, in some fission reactions, there, are, there is pure photons that are created as well. Okay? So a chain reaction is a self-sustaining self reaction in which the products of one reaction event stimulate further reaction events. The reason we're bringing up this concept is it's a natural fit for fusion. Because, as you see, there are three neutrons produced in the, in the fission of uranium-235. Right? We see it right there. Three neutrons. Well, each of those neutrons is capable of causing its own fission event. Here's a case where there's just two being created due to kind of the constraints of visualizing it. And we can see, right, we get two um, subsequent fission events for the first one. Each of those causes an additional two. And what we have is exponential growths of fission events. So a chain reaction in uranium, well, a small amount fizzles out because what ends up happening is the neutrons end up escaping the sample, right? So if the sample is too small, and one, one driving factor here is that we have the volume to surface ratio because remember, volume scales up with the cube of distance, whereas surface area only scales up with the square of distance. So as things get big, bigger and bigger, they have a greater volume to surface area, surface area ratio. And when they're very small, they have a lot of surface area per volume. And that means there's a lot of opportunities for the neutrons to escape, notwithstanding the fact that there's just, you know, that each, each reaction happens over a certain finite distance, and so the, the neutrons are simply going to escape the sample. But if the sample is large enough, then there's just going to be more and more reactions. It's just going to keep going. And that's a critical amount. So when you have a critical amount, what do you get? You get an uncontrolled chain reaction, which leads to, you guessed it, an explosion. All right? So the greater the surface area of a piece of fission material, the... Think about, think about the answer here. The less likely an explosion. And we mean surface area, we really kind of mean ratio, and we could also mean certain shapes, right? So obviously not all shapes have the same surface area to volume ratio. Often when we talk about the surface area to volume ratio, we're assuming a, a sphere, 
which is your best, which is always your best case in terms, in terms of having surface area to volume ratio. If you had like a sheet, for example, then that, 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 um, that geometry, that volume would have significantly more surface area. Okay. So which of these nuclei has the greatest mass? All right. So think about, you know, about the periodic table and about atoms, right? Of course, uranium, right? It has 235 nucleons, which means it has an atomic mass of 235. And then you can convert that over to kilograms by, by considering the average weight of each nucleon. So in which of these nuclei does the proton have the greatest mass? This is an odd question. This is something we really haven't thought about much. The key term here, by the way, we'll talk about it a bit, is the idea of binding energy. Because it turns out, because of mass energy equivalences, that mass, that it, it's kind of a fuzzy line when you get down to the atom itself, especially the nucleus of the atom. And it's hard to tell what is mass and what's energy. And it turns out that when you look at these nucleons, they don't all have the same mass. Not all neutrons have the same mass. Not all protons have the same mass. A proton will have more or less mass depending on what atom it's in. And that's because the, remember, it's a wave after all. It's, you know, it, has, it has a wave particle duality. And the particular wave states, the quantum states that it exists in inside the nucleus dictate how it behaves in its matter energy sense. And it, so the simple, the simple fact is that, that you have more binding energy for certain elements and less for others. Okay. Now you may not know the answer here, but it's hydrogen. Hydrogen has the greatest of any element on the periodic table. Okay. It has the most massive nucleons, most massive nucleons. Okay. Which means it would be really bad for, for fission. But first of all, if you just had, you know, your standard version of hydrogen, there'd actually be nothing to break apart because it is just a single proton. Now, if you had deuterium, which is a proton and a neutron, I suppose you could undergo fission up between that proton and the neutron, but it wouldn't give you any energy. And we'll talk about that. Okay. It would, it would only consume energy. So in which of these nuclei does the proton have the least mass? So this is called the, the, basically the binding energy valley. And it's a very special element. It's very well known in astronomy because it turns out that all stars, as they undergo fusion, end up with a lot of leftover of this material. And then that's, that's the leftover core that can then, then, then you know, collapse into a neutron star or a black hole. And this particular special element is none other than iron, all right? And it's, you know, it's, it's the, bottom, the, the bottom of the binding energy valley, okay? And there's some figures being referred to here down in the explanation that you can look up in your book, all right? So binding of, or, okay, maybe. All right, it is the bottom of the binding energy valley, okay? All right, so when uranium nucleus undergoes fission, the energy released is primarily, primarily in the form of, I said this a minute ago, right, that most of the energy is in the form of the kinetic energy of the fission fragments. Now, a lot of times we think about fission just creating pure energy. Well, we, we, we are, right? Kinetic energy is a form of energy, essentially heat energy, random motion of particles. And then we use that heat to then boil water. And that's how we actually, you know, get, get the energy and, and particularly the electricity from, the, from this, this nuclear fission reaction. Um, you know, that said, there is some pure energy, but most of it is the kinetic energy of the fragments, okay? And pure energy would be radiant light, light energy. So here we have sort of a basic understanding of a fission bomb, okay? All right, so here's an explosion that drives a subcritical piece down a barrel to collide with an, another subcritical piece. So think about this. You have two pieces that themselves wouldn't be, wouldn't be large enough to have an explosion. They have too much surface area, too much opportunity for the neutrons produced from each fission reaction to escape and thus you know, not cause a out of control chain reaction. All right, and there, here we have a source that's just continually producing neutrons, right? So it's bombarding into them, but the, the neutrons basically are going into both of the samples of uranium and fizzling out, okay? But when you have an explosion of a conventional kind of like TNT or something, conventional explosion, it drives the two pieces together. They're still being bombarded by the radioactive neutron source. And there's certain elements that have that are radioactive in the sense that they don't, re don't release alpha particles or beta particles or gamma particles for that matter. They release neutrons, okay? And there's a couple that are well known and they're, they're very important for fission, okay? And so then the idea is then, then you have a gun type because the gun is the idea that this, the, two, this, the smaller subcritical piece crashes into the bigger one. And then, well, now you have enough and it will cause an explosion, okay? A much larger explosion obviously than the conventional one that drove the piece down the barrel. The explosion will be massive because there's a lot of energy involved in nuclear processes. Okay, but what about instead of blowing something up, what about getting power, useful power from it? Well, nuclear fission reactors, about 20% of the electric energy in the United States is generated by nuclear, um, nuclear fission reactors. It's substantial, okay? 
hasn't gone down that much, hasn't gone up either, right? Because of uh, because of some unpopularity with the method. More in some other countries, about 75% in France, right? It's remarkably high. Reactors are simple nuclear furnaces that boil water to operate steam-driven generators. You know, so the boiling water rises, the boiling water turns a turbine, that turbine has, you know, probably some copper, copper wire wrapped around it, that copper wire turns within the magnetic field, thus generating a current on the wire, you got yourself an electric generator, driven by the rising steam, the rising steam which itself is being boiled by nuclear power, okay? So today, today's fission reactors contain three components. The nuclear fuel is pri primarily uranium-238 plus 3% of 235. The control rods are made of neutron-absorbing material, usually cadmium or boron. Water surrounding the nuclear fuel is kept under high pressure to keep it at a high temperature without boiling, okay? Here's a diagram of the plant. You can see that the actual boiling water that comes in contact with the rods is completely closed off from the outside world. So when you, when you see steam rising, that, that, you know, like rising from the cooling tower, that is never steam that was, got, that was brought into contact with an actual you know, nuclear sample. All right? There's lead shielding between the boiling water and the heat exchanger. Okay? So there's the idea. Generator, power lines, transformer, things we've talked about before. All right? So... Another type of reactor is a breeder reactor, where plutonium-239, like uranium-235, uh, undergoes fusion when it captures a neutron, right? So they both have that in common, okay? The breeder reactor works on the idea that the plutonium-239, um, um, which is um, a byproduct of uranium-238, um, and it burns uranium-235, okay? This occurs in all reactors to some extent. In a few years, it can produce twice as much fissionable fuel as it began with. A more attractive alternative, um, when uranium-235 reserves are limited, and fuel for breeder reactors may be today's radioactive waste. Okay? All right. So the benefits are plentiful, um, are plentiful electricity, conservation of billions of tons of fossil fuels every year that are converted to heat and smoke, right? Because there's really, there's, there's no, you know, adverse effect um, in terms of global warming from, from nuclear power. Um, furthermore, the, um, el the elimination of megatons of carbon dioxide, sulfur oxides, and other... Um, deleterious substances put into the air each year by burning of fossil fuels, the drawbacks include the risk of releasing radioactive isotopes into the atmosphere by accident or terrorist activities, and the waste disposal, because inevitably there is a significant amount of waste, okay? All right, but we may find something to do with, would do with it later. So here we have E equals mc squared, right? This is um, in the early 1900s, Albert, Albert Einstein discovered that mass is actually congealed energy, right? Funny way of thinking about it, but it's fair. Enormous work is required to pull the nucleons from a nucleus. This work is energy added to the nucleon that, that is pulled out, right? That's the idea. That's why I say there's, it's a fuzzy line between mass and energy in terms of that binding energy. That binding energy effectively is the extra mass that the nucleon has, okay? So continuing the idea with the mass, mass energy equivalents, where the measurement of atomic masses are made with this device. So this, this measures them um, based on their, their charge property as they pass through a magnetic field, all right, and their deflection. So electrically charged isotopes directed into a semicircular drum are forced into curved paths by a strong magnetic field of known strength. Lighter isotopes will take a smaller radius path, and the heavier ones, with, with, because of their extra um, mass, will take a larger radius path, and then we can calibrate that path to measure the mass. Okay, so the plot shows how nuclear masses increase with increasing atomic number. So an experiment like this allows us to create a graph like this. So what do we see, right? We see that nuclear mass goes up with atomic number, but it doesn't go up linearly, does it, right? Nuclear mass, first, is fairly linear, right? So, you know, if you go, if you look at hydrogen, you know, it's got one, right? You look at, you look at um, helium, it's Bit different, I guess, because there's four, right? So you kind of have a jump there. But then as you go on, you end, you end up kind of having like a steady, a steady increase, right? It's a it's a pretty linear increase until you kind of get past iron. Once you get the you know elements like mercury and gold, you you start getting a lot of extra neutrons per proton, and that's why the curve starts getting steeper. Okay, it starts getting steeper because of those extra neutrons. Okay. All right. So here is the valley that I mentioned before. Okay. There it is right there, okay? That's the bottom of the valley, okay? Because the idea is that when we think about this graph, and then we think about the mass per nucleon, we see that the mass per nucleon does not remain constant. In fact, it has pretty dramatic. So over here at hydrogen, the, that one proton has a lot of mass. However, the 235 total nucleons in uranium-235 don't have nearly as much mass per nucleon, okay? Now, you know, we can see that the actual, you know, mass per, per atom is bigger because there's just more neutrons, but the actual mass per 
nucleon, neutrons and protons combined, is less, okay? It is, it's substantially less. Look at the difference, right? Look at that, the horizontal line, right? Substantially less. But uranium does have more mass per nucleon than, say, something like plutonium over here, all right? And so, you know, that's the idea, is that as you move into smaller elements from uranium, you get less mass per nucleon. And that means that you can generate energy by going in this direction from uranium, and then you can generate energy from going from this direction from hydrogen, okay? So look, look at the idea here, uranium-235. The nucleon in, uran in the uranium nucleus has more mass. We split it into its two daughter fragments, okay, shown here. And the uranium nucleus fragments that are now nuclei of atoms such as barium and krypton, krypton, barium, they have less mass per nucleon, okay? The nucleon in the uranium fragment has less mass. So that means we lost mass. Well, if we lost mass, wh where did they go? It became energy. Now again, you might think it just becomes pure light, but actually it primarily becomes the kinetic energy of the, of the fragments, of the daughter nuclei of the fission reaction. But regardless, it turns from mass into energy. It is the conversion of mass into energy, right? And it happens with fission of large nuclei such as that of uranium-235, okay? So that's a way of generating energy, breaking apart large nuclei. And it would even work for something like, like boron, right? You could, you could, or barium. You could split barium apart into, into fragments and it would create things that are lighter. It would work to a lesser extent for krypton because see, krypton is where the, the, the graph starts to get pretty level, right? Notice the steepness here is not very dramatic. So you're better off doing it with the heaviest elements because the, the actual curve is steeper. See that? So you're getting more energy per fission event, okay? So nuclear fusion is the opposite of nuclear fission. The fission fizzes things apart, okay, breaks them apart. Fusion fuses them together, all right? Each release energy in accord with, accord with the figure, right? In particular, this figure here. But look at, look, at the, look at fusion, right? So fusion would be over here, okay? Fission is over here. Well, which one, which one do you think makes more energy, right? Has the potential of making more energy? Well, obviously fusion, because fusion is where the graph, the change in, the, in the, the energy per nucleon, the mass per nucleon, is incredibly dramatic. Look how steep it is over here. For these heavy elements, excuse me, for these light elements, the, the, the change is really dramatic. So if you fuse together a couple of hydrogens and helium, you've got a lot of energy because you lost a lot of mass. You went from here all the way down to there. There's no way to get a difference that big with any fission event, not even close. So fusion is way more energetic, much more per, per event, okay, per nuclear event, okay? All right, so here's, here's the idea, right? Taking, we have hydrogen two atoms, that's also known as deuterium, okay? They have more mass per nucleon, whether that's a proton or a neutron, and when you fuse them together to make helium four, then now that helium four has less mass per nucleon. The, where did the mass go? It became energy, okay? We got energy out of the process. A substantial amount, okay? Okay, so fission and fusion compared. Less mass per nucleon occurs in both processes, okay? You had more mass to begin with the uranium. What you split it apart into has, has less mass, right? You put them on a scale, the uranium, the, 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 uranium, the, the product or the, um, the input would weigh more than the output. When you, do, when you do fusion, the input weighs, here's the input over here, the input weighs more than the output, okay? Here's the output. The output is the helium, the input is four hydrogens, okay? Or two hydrogens and two neutrons, but you know, it's how, how whatever particular fusion process we're talking about. Okay, here are a couple of typical fusion reactions, all right? Here we have two deuteriums becoming a, hel a helium-3, which is an isotope of helium, and then, and a free neutron and some extra pure radiant energy. Okay, and then here's another fusion reaction where you get a deuterium, a hydrogen three. Okay, so this is actually an isotope of hydrogen with only one proton and two neutrons. This is a much rarer um, isotope of hydrogen than deuterium. Deuterium is a, you can actually like kind of like find it. You can like you can like sample it out from a random sample of hydrogen, and then this is going to produce helium four and a neutron. Okay, so these are two typical types of fusion reactions. And when I say typical. Are they like occurring in co uh, commercial, you know, power plants? No, there are no commercial fusion power plants to date, right? You know, we may be close to building our first ones in the next decade, decade or so. But where does this happen? In stars. 
okay? This is absolutely what stars do. This is how they produce their energy, all right? So an effusion reaction converts a pair of hydrogen isotopes to an alpha particle and a neutron. Remember, an alpha particle is just an ionized helium-4 nucleus, or just an iso I, I, I guess you really could say it, an ionized helium-4 atom, which then is just the nucleus, um, and a neutron. Most of the energy released is in the form of, I bet you can guess it, kinetic energy again, okay? But in this case, it's not the kinetic energy of, because before with the fission, it was the kinetic energy of the fragments. Here, it's not the kinetic energy of, the, of the, um, the alpha particle. It's the kinetic energy of the extra neutron that's left over. That's actually where most of the energy goes, okay? So by momentum conservation, you can show that's the case. You can actually show it at a pretty simple algebraic level. We won't do it here, but it can be shown that the momentum conservation shows the neutron must pick up most of the energy. Okay, so how do you control fusion? Well, carrying out fusion is more difficult than thought when, f when fission succeeded, right? And so, I mean, it, there's this kind of this, this moment in history in the 1970s in particular where, you know, we're probably, you know, three decades into fission, you know, being done and everyone thought fusion was around the corner. Well, here we are 50 years later and we still don't have commercial fusion. It's been very, very difficult to achieve. Okay, plasma reactors have not been successful. Other schemes include lasers are being considered, and there's you know there, there's experimental ones that don't that don't actually produce enough energy to be commercial commercially viable. But we do have fusion. We can we can do it on the experimental level. The, um, it's being it's done in Livermore. All right, but it's not it's not happening again in a way that would actually create enough power to be viable. All right, um, deuterium pe uh, pellets rhythmically dropped into a um, synchronized laser crossfire heat used to produce steam, right? So these are all kind of methods that are being tried out. So in either a fission event or a fusion event, the quantity that remains unchanged is, that's a good one, think about this. Make sure you got it, you got it, okay? The number of nucleons, okay? So we never lose a particle. There's a, there's a conservation of particles. We don't, we can have particles change type, right? but we never actually completely lose a nucleon, all right? Which is very interesting. And it's, it's a fundamental kind of property that there, there's, there's things that are conserved other than energy. And you see this as you get into particle physics. There's this conserva conservation of particle types, including, and really what, what the, the fundamental idea, we won't get into it, but the fundamental principle that's allowing us to conserve nucleons is the quarks that build the nucleons, which are the building blocks of nucleons, these things called quarks, okay? All right. And there you have it, okay? So we introduced a couple of big ideas here, basically a, a basic explanation of nuclear fission and fusion, and perhaps most importantly, this idea that the mass per nucleon does not remain constant, that is actually dependent on where we are in the periodic table. This figure is so crucial to understanding both fission and fusion, and is such a fascinating figure in terms of this, this, this understanding of a universe that, that can produce power on the very light side and the very heavy side, but not in the middle, certainly not with iron. Okay, well, I hope this has been an interesting and informative lecture. Thank you so much for watching.